Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 13 of the Computer Business Marketing Show. Today's episode is brought to you by TechSite Builder. TechSite Builder is a hosted website builder that allows you to quickly and easily get a clean and professional website up and running for your computer or tech-focused business. Save time and frustration with TechSite Builder. Learn more at TechSiteBuilder.com. Also, the show is brought to you by the DC Unconvention 2017, the second annual conference for IT business owners. Learn from fellow tech and business owners, get business strategies that work in the real world, and discover new tech. Learn more at unconvention.io. On this episode, today we have Ian Alexander of Repair Tech here to talk about how to market your recurring services. When is the right time to tell a customer about your managed service offering, and how do you approach residential differently than uh, business clients? Plus, in the tip of the week, I go on kind of a rant about Facebook ads and stick around because Paco has a huge announcement about his involvement in this show. All that and so much more coming up right now. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Computer Business Marketing Show. If you own or work in an IT services business, this is the place to learn how to get more clients, keep them happy, and grow your revenue. You can watch, download, and or subscribe to all show episodes at computerbusinessmarketing.com. You can also catch our live stream on Facebook every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Just be sure to like the Tech Site Builder Facebook page, click the following tab, and then see first so that the live stream will jump to the top of your Facebook feed. Welcome guys to another episode of the Computer Business Marketing Show. We are live on Facebook right now. Thanks for the folks who tune in live. You guys uh, always get a special treat because we have a, a little pre-show that we always do and we let you uh, ask questions and, and um, kind of interact with you more. It's, it's hard to interact when we're doing the recorded version of the show because we've got to stick to the script and, and all that stuff. But um, the pre-show is a lot of fun. We, sometimes we do a little post-show as well. Uh, so definitely make sure to to tune in to the live shows. We love having you there. Uh, but for this show, uh, we have an awesome guest. His name is Ian Alexander, and you might know him. He's from uh, Repair Tech Solutions, and they've got some awesome products, uh, one of the most recent being Kabuto. I know a lot of you guys use and love Kabuto. Um, we're going to have him on, uh, though, to talk about marketing recurring services. Um, I know Ian does a lot of work with marketing for his businesses. He also talks with a lot of computer business owners, and he sees what's working and not working for them. Uh, so we're going to go into uh, some tips and tricks and strategies for uh, better marketing your recurring services, anything that you, you want to deliver to your clients on a recurring basis, whether that's monthly, quarterly, annually, whatever. So definitely stick around for that featured topic. We're going to be digging into that soon. But before we do that, I just want to see what's going on with my co-host, Paco LeBron from Prodigy Techs. How have you been, Paco? Better than good, better than most. How are you? Right. I am good. I'm hot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm glad I'm here in my, in my, <laughs> wait a minute. Um, I'm glad I'm here in my, uh, my home office. The air conditioning is working. Um, though I do use these, like these, these studio ish lights to get the, to get some good lighting and, and that kind of heats things up a little bit. Um, but other than that, <laughs> I'm good. people don't care <laughs> what, what I feel like. Um, but other than that, I'm good. Business is good. Um, Let's see. So I'll go into what I've been up to, and then we can go into what you've been up to. So what I've been up cool. to is this past weekend we had WordCamp DC. So this nice. is the uh, the you know folks who are in the WordPress space, which I am in, building WordPress websites. Um, you uh, WordPress as an organization holds, and, and they they don't really hold them because WordPress is an open source software, and so they they encourage communities to hold these things called WordCamps. And it's basically like a WordCamp meetup conference type thing that occurs in different cities all over the country. And so there's WordCamps all over the world. Um, DC had its first WordCamp this weekend. Uh, it had never had a WordCamp before. So that was fun to go to. Um, it was right there in downtown DC. And uh, it was two, three days, actually, of talks and demos and uh, workshops. And then they have a Contributors Day on Sunday, which basically means you help to contribute to WordPress, again, because it's open source, they don't really have a staff of people to, 
to work on WordPress. It's all volunteer based. So they have the contributor day to get folks to just, you know, since they're at the conference, might as well sit down and help contribute to WordPress, whether it's, it's anything from coding to design to answering support questions. So you don't even need to be technical to, um, to contribute to WordPress. Uh, so that's something to look into. You know, if you um, want to, if you use WordPress and you build WordPress sites for your clients or whatever, and you want to see WordPress continue to flourish, uh, as an open source software, that's something to look into is look for a WordCamp around you and, uh, and then, it, it, then see how you can kind of contribute to the, the whole community because um, it it's a cool community. It's, it's very supportive. It's very cool. Um, and it's huge. Uh, you know, it's, it's, for folks who are into Linux, it's kind of like that. I mean, it's just a huge community of folks who are always tweaking and, and it's designers and developers and users and bloggers and a bunch of different folks. Uh, so, so that's cool. I, I love going to WordCamps, and it's just a kind of a fun experience. You get to um, mingle with like-minded folks, kind of like the unconvention, which we'll get into later. But um, that that would be a good segue into that as well. They're they're similar style of events and similar types of things. Um, so you know, uh, business has just been kind of going going as usual. Nothing really new or different or bad or good to report. It's just kind of rolling along. Summer is a little, usually a little slow for me in all aspects of, of work. Um, I think just, you know, clients tend to take, take time off during the summer. Um, so things slow down a little bit, but, you know, still working on a couple projects, um, still working on some new stuff for Tech Site Builder that will be announced here in a couple weeks. Um, so keep your eyes out for that if you're a Tech Site Builder client. And uh, when I was at WordCamp, um, one of my favorite talks didn't have to do with WordPress, didn't have to do with web development, didn't have to do with web design. It had to do with productivity. And I'm, you know, I'm always interested in different, different productivity methods and hacks and that kind of thing because, you know, as someone who works from home, who works for myself, who doesn't have a boss telling me what to do, I'm the, I'm the person who needs to prioritize the things. I'm the person who needs to execute. And I'm the person who is always the bottleneck in my business. And, I think, you know, learning good productivity habits is the way to kind of open up the bottleneck that is myself. Um, and so some of the productivity uh, talks at WordCamp were really awesome. You know, stuff that, I mean, we all know all of the tips. If you've, you know, if you've read Getting Things Done, if you've read, you know, some of the productivity books that are out there and you read the blogs and stuff, um, you know, you know, what is good to do, but you always need those reminders. I, I'm the kind of person who like, I get on a productivity bend and, and I, you know, and I, and I do all these things and I'm super productive for a couple months and then life gets in the way and things happen and I start to fall out of those habits and forget some of the things. Um, but each time I do that, I hold on to like one or two productive things that continue on through my life. So I like to kind of cycle through productivity kicks. And so I got a little kick in the butt at WordCamp around productivity um, one of the big things was was the whole inbox zero mentality of making sure that every day you clear out your email inbox. And to do that, you either, you know, if you can take care of something in a couple minutes, you take care of it. Otherwise, you, um, you defer it to later or you assign it to someone and that someone could be including yourself. So I could make a task in my task manager to take care of that email. But whatever I do, I need to just process the email and get it out of my inbox. Because sometimes I have a tendency to use my inbox as a to-do list or as a repository for things I need to remember or keep on the front of my mind. And the inbox is kind of like a desk. And it, you know, you, your desk can start to get cluttered with stuff and then you eventually lose all the things at the bottom of the desk that are getting buried by new stuff and you just tend to drop the ball on things. So, um, so I'm, I'm getting back to my inbox zero kick where you know, every day in the morning I process all the new emails that came in and I do something with them, get them out of the inbox, and then I do that again at the end of the day. Um, and so far since WordCamp, which has only been three days, <laughs> I've, I've maintained an inbox zero. Um, so we'll, we'll see how long that lasts. Um, but uh, that's just something to, to keep in mind, you know, just keep, pr keep, keep productivity in the top of your mind and always kind of revisit it. Um, cause you know, you can say, Hey, I've, I've read, you know, the productivity books. I know what to do, but are you really doing everything that you read? Uh, sometimes you need to remember some of those little tips and tricks that, that you forget along the way. So that's kind of my, what's going on with me plus a bonus tip. Um, so that's about it. Uh, Paco, uh, what have you been up to? 
Yeah, so on our end, what we've been doing is really getting into more, I mean, I've been working more of the brand awareness because similar to you, usually I don't have much of a dip in the summer. I actually have pretty consistent during the summer. It's more the holidays is when I have it uh, that kind of go down a little bit for me. Yeah. But um, what we're doing now is just kind of do more brand awareness. That's kind of our play this month. So uh, we're reaching out to the cham uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in Illinois that we just joined back in a couple months ago. And so they offer some real estate on their social media blast and their email blast. So working on copy, working on getting that over to them. Also working with a couple of the condominium towers that are nearby my office and working with the real estate or property managers there to offer a loss leader of a free diagnostic. Um, so mm -hmm. essentially what we, what I looked at the numbers is for every client that I, so out of every 10 clients, two of them don't go with the service and pay the diagnostic fee, which is $79. Now, I figure if I offer that as a free, as a free incentive, technically it's not really costing me any money outside of the two out of every 10 people that come in. The eight that come in will always get the repairs, which I really don't lose anything. I'm not discounting the service. I'm not discounting any parts. The only thing I lose out on is if the person says, you know what, it's not worth it. And I don't make a convincing sell on selling them a new computer or et cetera. That's on me. But outside of that, I only lose 20% of those free diagnostics that come in on each individual channel. So um, starting it out with the condominium towers that I've seen a lot of their, their residents coming into our shop and they're nearby the office. And then going to be doing that with the Google AdWords that you helped me out with that uh, squeeze page on um, on the website for Windows crash repairs. But we actually adjusted that to focusing on on sites. So we've turned off Google AdWords for income uh, incoming drop-offs and we're focusing on the hourly uh on sites for both residential and business to mm -hmm. try and bring a little bit more cash flow into the business as well so we adjusted that campaign uh, as far as on a branding method and then as i mentioned with the chamber with that real estate happening and the annual conference coming up august 4th i figured it's a good time for me to start really utilizing what's available for our membership. So that's what we're doing in the next couple of weeks. And that's interesting. So you, you find, sorry to interrupt, you find yeah. that um, the on sites are, you get more cash flow from those types of clients. Correct. Yeah. You because, like um, services. yep. So even, so as far as the flat fees, I always calculate the labor on the amount of time I feel that I'm going to spend on it per that hourly rate. Uh, however, with a business hourly, it's much more than my residential hourly. So mm -hmm. if let's say for every four hours of a business residential, it's six hours, resi uh, or I'm sorry, every four hours for business uh, on site is for every six residential. Right. And then with that, if they're just drop offs, you know, they have to find my location, they have to come to it. And I feel that if I offer more convenience in our branding, that's going to get more people to kind of, basically take advantage of what we have to offer um, cool. because just like me, people are lazy. So we want to <laughs> adhere and help them out as best as possible and, you know, kind of go from there. Yeah. And I, I feel like a, a client who is willing to like invite you into their home or office is going to build that much more of a rapport with you and build that much more of a connection to you than someone who's just, you know, dropping something off. It's like, here's my stuff. Let me get out of here, you know, take care of it kind of thing. Yep. And it's funny that you bring that up because being that I have a virtual office, they only ever see my receptionist unless I call them on a quote, an estimate or anything like that. So what I've been doing starting as of this morning, I've called basically all our clients from like three years ago that our marketing, our marketer campaign from Repair Shopper hasn't sent them anything in a while. I essentially call them see how's everything going, see if there's any work that could be done. And if not, I asked them if I can, I would really appreciate an honest feedback in the form of a review and either Google Maps or on Yelp um, or Facebook, it would, depending on where they're at, just to kind of explain, you know, their, their experience with us. And so that way, nice. if I don't get a sale, if I don't get any type of potential referral, I can at least get a review to help grow our standing in those uh, local listings. So mm -hmm. that's what we've also been doing on our branding play as well. Cool. Yep. Awesome. So good luck with that. Um, 
and then and you, you have a big announcement to make as well <laughs> <laughs> regarding the computer business marketing show. Yes. So it's actually not just the computer business marketing show. Um, I will probably do an episode over on PodNuts, either whether it be a PodNuts Daily or on the PodNuts group. Uh, so I basically am letting everyone know that next week will actually be my last episode on the Computer Business Marketing Show. Uh, I will be taking a hiatus from podcasting for a little bit. Uh, things have basically realigned on some of the priorities on my end. And unfortunately, just because of that, I won't be able to be on air on the specific commitments that I've given before. So as everyone knows, I hear weekly every Wednesday and with pod nuts, it was every Sunday went to every other Sunday. And now basically I will go ahead and be taking a hiatus from podcasting. So uh, for all those that have uh, expressed a lot of feedback, your support, I greatly appreciate it. But if you want to catch me on next week's episode on the computer business marketing show, that will actually be, as I mentioned, my last show. And then Matt will be, I assume, flying solo from here on out, taking the show to new heights. Yeah, so um, so it's definitely a bummer. I'm, I'm sure everyone can agree that it's it's uh, a bummer that we're going to be losing Paco. I mean, it, you know, it was it was such, I think, a, a shot, an injection of um, energy or whatever you want to call it in the show when we brought you on uh, a couple years ago to the computer business um, to the computer business podcast and uh and i think that was probably one of the best decisions i made for the podcast because it really helped me stay on track it it had someone that i can have rapport with and i think we had a good rapport and it had also you know a different um perspective because right. now you know I'm, I'm focusing on websites and so it's cool to still have someone in the in the computer repair and, and it services space so it's definitely going to be um you're definitely going to be missed it's um and we talked about this before, so I'm just kind of saying some of this again publicly, but um, it's it's going to be a bummer, and we're going to, con you know, of course, we're going to continue on with the show, um, and I know you're not going to be a stranger as far as, like, in the Facebook groups and stuff, and, right. and you'll still be around, and, and we might bring you on if, if you have some time, but I think, you know, this is, you got to do what's best for you and your business, and I think right now, you know, you know you need to focus on the business. You got to put, put all the time you can into that, and I, I completely agree, because, I mean, I... I wasn't doing a podcast when I first started my computer business. I was just doing nothing but hustling and focus on the, focusing on the business. Right. And even though podcast is, uh, people might think it's it's a small commitment. It it's really you know people don't see like the preparation and the and the lead up to things and and it can take a big chunk out of your day or your week even. Um, so uh, we definitely want you to do what's best for your business, and uh, we'll be. Uh, We'll be missing you, and uh, I think I'm just going to go ahead and, and do the show uh, on my own for a while, and then just see kind of where things go from there. Um, uh, the bringing on a co-host was a very um, kind of uh, what's the word? Um, there's a word for it, <laughs> where like something just happens. You don't plan for it; it just kind of happens, and the stars align. Yeah, impromptu. Um, and so yeah, this, the, just the stars aligned and, and that's why I brought on a co-host. I hadn't really, I was thinking about it, but I hadn't really, you know, made any plans for it. So right now I'll just kind of keep the computer business marketing show going and, and see what happens from there, but we'll definitely miss you and, uh, and don't be a stranger. Of course. Cool. All right. Um, so let's, let's, let's go ahead and, uh, get into our, <laughs> yeah, let's <laughs> do an upper, <laughs> um, so let's go into our feature topic because I want to dig into this uh, before too long, but uh, I want to make sure to give a shout out to one of our sponsors first. Uh, the first sponsor I will mention is TechSite Builder. TechSite Builder is the platform for you to build your computer business website on. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of other platforms for websites out there. Um, lo lots of low cost solutions like WordPress, for example, you can install and configure and maintain uh, your own WordPress site. You can sign up for something like Squarespace or Wix, um, which have low monthly fees, or even there's some like free things like, like Weebly, I think, and, and web.com and a couple other ones where you can have a, have a website for free. So all of those places are great. You can get a website up f with no problem on those, on those platforms. But uh, how 
how um, how are those websites working for your business? Are they set up to convert specifically for computer businesses for your for the type of business you're in? Are they um, do they give you the tools you need to build a website specifically for a computer business? Uh, do they hold webinars and um, training videos on how to set up your your pages and your your blogs and your posts and your SEO specifically tailored for IT services business? Uh, that's a big fat no. <laughs> and Tech Site Builder uh, does provide all of those things for you. Um, it is the website building platform for computer business owners. We make it super simple to get a clean and professional website up and running. Not only that, but we give you all the tools you need as a computer business owner to be successful. We give you the, the SEO training and back end that you need. And we even provide additional services like blog writing, content writing, and a bunch of other stuff to help you be successful. And if you don't have time to put that into your own website, we'll take care of it for you. We've been doing this now for quite a few years. We have a lot of experience. We know what works for computer business websites, and we'd love to help you uh, reach your goals for your website for your IT services business. So head on over to techsitebuilder.com, check it out. And uh, if you need a new website or your website's not performing how it should, we can definitely help you out with that. Again, it's techsitebuilder.com. All right, guys, so let's dig into the interview for today. Today we have Ian Alexander, as I mentioned before. and. Hello. Uh, Hey, hey, how's it going? Thanks for uh, chilling out there patiently while we uh, went through the rigmarole of, of the podcast. Um, no problem. So why don't you just kind of introduce yourself to folks. Most folks know who you are. You've been on the uh, podcast before, but for those who are new, tell us a, a little bit about the company you're from and a little bit about uh, your background and what brings you uh, to the point where you are today. Sure. Uh, so my name is Ian Alexander. I'm the CEO and co-founder of RepairTech and we make software for IT professionals. So we have a couple products. Um, I'll get into those in a second, but you asked me about my background. Um, I was a computer engineering major at Cal Poly. I also ran and eventually sold a computer repair business. Before that, I worked as a bench tech, so I've been in that world, um, and then I wanted to help solve the problems I was having uh, with the computer repair process. So that was going, that was very tedious because I had to click next and finish and remove on every single repair. So the initial problem I wanted to solve was automating that. That was our flagship initial product, TechSuite, uh, that basically just automates the computer repair process. Since then, we've released other stuff like Kabuto, which helps you get more recurring revenue for your IT business. Um, so that's kind of the background uh, in, the, in a nutshell what RepairTech does. Cool. And, you know, I love that uh, you and, and some of the other services out there who, who the founder is, comes from, you know, a computer repair background and they initially were built a product to, you know, scratch their own itch or to solve a problem, a real world problem that they were encountering. Because um, I have interviewed folks in the past or I've talked to folks at like trade shows and stuff who've started companies where they they didn't come from a computer repair background. They they, you know, were, you know, somebody out of the valley who wanted to start, wanted to start a startup and they were doing their research on what, you know, what vertical would be best and what, you know, industry they should go into. And they said, oh, computer, you know, IT services looks like a hot thing and let me start a, an app over here. And, and you know, they, they, they kind of don't have that connection to the community like, like you do. And so totally. I think that's very cool and, and, and that's appreciated. It definitely helped me. I, uh, you know, I was at one point running the repair business and repair tech at the same time, and kind of dog fooding our products. And um, yeah, those were in the early yeah. days, so that was kind of rough. The products were not that great, um, so I was testing them doing while doing my own computer repairs, and uh, it definitely helped out. And that was a lot of fun. It's fun to see something like that be an idea, and then. Um, be able to solve a problem that you're having. Yeah, and grow into something that lots of other people are using and, and it's solving their problems too. So that's right. cool. Um, so what we want to dig into um, on this show is talking about you know, how, to, how to market recurring services. Before we get into that and kind of why we're getting into that is you know, one of the services that you guys offer is Kabuto. And uh, can you just go into a little bit about what Kabuto does and, and how it works? And that'll kind of lead us into the conversation we're going to have. 
Sure. So Kabuto was our second product and it started off as just a feature request from a customer. They said, Hey, can you build something into tech suite to make it so that customers can send me a message whenever they need help? And we thought that was a really cool idea, but it clearly didn't fit into the scope of what tech suite is for. Um, so we brainstormed a little bit and that spiraled into a whole nother set of ideas. And eventually that became Kabuto. And so what Kabuto is, is an application that you install on your client's machines after you service them. And then when they bring the computer home, it detects issues and is able to show them a little message with your branding and contact information in it. And it's able to basically say, hey, we noticed your hard drive is failing, or we noticed that you had a recent application crash or a blue screen of death or whatever. And they can click, click a button to request service. And then you get an email you're able to contact them, you get another job, right? So that's what we call the, the base functionality of Kabuto. It's essentially a marketing and lead generation tool. Um, and then on top of that, eventually we got all these feature requests and it's kind of transformed into not just a marketing tool, but a remote monitoring and management platform. So you're able to monitor those machines, see what the issues are, red light, green light kind of thing. You can, it has a third party, patch management for applications. It has Windows patch management. Uh, we have managed antivirus in there now. There's all kinds of cool features and we're building stuff and releasing stuff every week. So that's kind yeah. of the down low on Kabuto. Yeah, that's cool. It's amazing how a, a product starts to evolve a, a based on user feedback. And sometimes it's like in directions you never expected it to go. Um, but you know, that's where people want, you, you just listen to the people, right? Listen to the people and give them what they want. And it totally. sounds like what you're doing, what you're doing with that. And so I know a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, business owners are using it as part of their managed services package or some kind of recurring package. Um, and I, and I think it's a great bundle, you know, something to bundle into that, uh, the original Kabuto and now with all of the managed ser features that it has, um, so I'm sure you're, you're talking with, with techs and, and seeing how they're utilizing it. Maybe just have some thoughts on your own. Um, I know that, you know, what, when I've tried to um, market recurring services, I always have the best luck, especially when I'm first getting started, is pitching it to my existing clients. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts around, you know, um, the best way to approach, it's like say you're, you're a computer business owner, you're starting at the beginning, you're just, you've been, just been doing break fix this whole time, but you want to get into um, doing recurring services for, for, you know, for your business and, and you, you think a good place to start is your existing clients. What's kind of a good way to, to get that conversation started? Sure. I got a couple things for you. So the first thing would be making a part of your everyday process. We actually... If you go to our website, repairtechsolutions.com, there's a five-day how to get started selling managed services guide. It's just one new thing every day. And then after five days, you're kind of, it's in your process. Mm -hmm. But I'll go over that stuff really quickly. Uh, one of the things that we've seen people be really successful with is integrating it into their check-in process. So you have a client that comes in and they say they have an issue. You have them fill out whatever forms at that point you say, hey, if you don't want this issue to happen in the future, we offer these managed services, it costs this much a month, would you be interested in doing that? And if you, you can use whatever you want, you don't have to use Kabuto. But if you're using Kabuto, what people do typically is they install the agent with just that baseline package that's the notification pop-ups, they do that for free. So they say, hey, we're gonna install this for you, it's a way for you to communicate with us. Anytime you have an issue, you right click our icon in the system tray, click request service and you can send us a message and we'll get in touch with you. So, you know, they don't lose anything from that. You're not charging them for it. Um, but mathematically the ROI is actually really good on that. Nice. Um, so that's one thing. And then if you can sell them on an antivirus, let's say they had a virus, it's a really easy pitch to be like, Hey, I have this antivirus that's way better than what you're currently using. If they're using anything and I can manage it for you so that it's always running. It's always up to date. Um, if somebody, if your kid uninstalls it, we'll automatically reinstall it for you. If you have malware, we'll get a notification and we can call you and make sure everything's okay. You can even, even offer them like free virus remediation in case it does find something. Um, you can bundle in like a pop-up blocker and open DNS if you want to. So people get creative with how they offer that package. Uh, and then there's monitoring as well. And 
we see people market that for, you know, anywhere from 15 to $25 if everything full inclusive. Yeah. Um, so uh, the check-in process is one thing that you can do. And that's not actually that intuitive for people. A lot of people tend to market that when the client picks up the machine. But mm -hmm. actually, it makes more sense to do it when they're feeling the pain as opposed to when they want to get the computer, give you your money, and get out of there. Nice, yeah. So that's, that's one thing. Yeah, so instead of um, someone comes in for a repair, and instead of just fix, saying, okay, I'll fix it, you say, well, hey, you know, instead of me, instead of you spending all this money for me to fix it, why don't you, you know, come on to this managed plan or this recurring plan or whatever you call it. Um, not only will we take care of this issue, but we'll take, you know, ongoing, you'll, right. you'll end up saving money in the long run. Type of yes. Thing. And you can bake in all kinds of stuff like Paco's free diagnostic idea. You can give them free diagnostics as a part of that plan and whatever. Right. So you can throw stuff in that has nothing to do with whatever your RMM solution is, or, you know, you can get creative with it. I think you, you hit a good point on that one because it, I do the same, I, exactly how you said it. That's exactly how I do it. I normally tell them about the recurring services after the service has been done, the main service that they came in with. But now as hearing you say that in the beginning, it makes more, so much more sense. And it doesn't even just have to be virus removals. Um, like I specifically focus on computer crashes, which I know it's either two things, uh, OS reinstall or replacing a hard drive. And a majority of the times, if the hard drive is just that bad or just, the OS is corrupted, I 80% of the time I can grab the data. But for all the time, I can simply say, hey, do you want to include a backup system after we've kind of done this reinstall? And I work with um, Cloudberry through our RMM system that resells that license, and that's a recurring revenue for me. Totally. So that just makes total sense to do it in the beginning versus doing it at the end because at the end you're always fighting to say hey after you've paid all this money we want to get this little bit more from you as well mm. whereas they haven't really brought out paid a dime and now you can kind of get them in there and it's a much smoother transition i really like that part right so that's one thing that people are pretty successful with i would say the other thing is if you want to do managed services with small business right and you are or you know small office home office and you are already doing break fix, that's actually, it's really good as a marketing tool. So what you can do is somebody comes in and they give you their computer. And if you notice that it's their work computer, or even if it's not, you can say, hey, I, I noticed this is your work computer. Don't you guys have a IT department or something? And usually what they'll say to you is, yeah, but it would take forever if, mm -hmm. if I brought it to them. So I'm bringing it to you instead. Or there's some reason why their IT department or whatever MSP is currently servicing them isn't cutting it, right? Yep. And so you can say, hey, I, you know, no pressure, but if you're interested, we can help you out with that. If you, if you have an IT department but you're overloaded, we can, out, we, can add like a, we can act like one of your overflow employees or something. So if you have too much stuff going on, just send it to us. We'll take care of it. And so the break fix thing can be a really good way to get leads for um, small business MSP stuff. Yeah, definitely. And that, that was going to be one of the questions I asked was what are some of the, the and maybe you could expand on this or, or think of something else. What are the differences in, in approach between residential versus small versus small business? Like for me, I always felt like um, small businesses would understand the value proposition of recurring services better than residential because you know small businesses their computers are like a business asset it's like a tool they rely on the computers to to run their business and they want to make sure that they're proactive about that um, but with residential clients they're more you know um, wanting to put out fires and they don't think ahead too much um, and and so it's I've, I've thought it would be a little bit harder to uh, to sell uh, recurring services to residential clients, but but is it? And does that same message work for residential? Or do you need to think of a different way to approach it? Yeah, that's a really good question. I do think it's harder to do residential MSP stuff, but I don't think it's because of the mentality thing. Um, as ex as an example, when you are selling to a small business, they have 30 computers, 20 computers, 50 computers, whatever. They're paying you 
however much for endpoint, you can warrant doing stuff that's not scalable for them because they're paying you however many thousands of dollars a month or something like that. Yeah. If they ask for something that's kind of unusual or something outside of your automated process, you can warrant doing that. So as an, a really simple example, their credit card doesn't work. So you don't get paid, right? So what do you do? When it's a small business client, you call them on the phone and you say, hey, this didn't work. And then they update it, right? And that's worth it because you're getting $1,000. Sure. But when someone's paying you 10 bucks a month, yeah. and there's 1,000 of them, and every month, X percentage of those people's credit cards fail for whatever reason, it's just not worth it for you to call. And so not only do they go past due and then they don't pay you, but now you have to go in and turn off their stuff in your RMM because they're not paying for it and it's an expense to you. Right. So you're actually losing money. And as you get more customers, which should be a good thing, it actually becomes more of a pain for you. So I would say like the biggest barrier is actually the fact that the tools haven't existed to make it scalable to do residential MSP stuff um, past like, you know, 30 customers. So right. that was kind of the impetus actually for recur. And, you know, you don't, it, it doesn't matter what tool you use. I don't care. But, um, I would say one of the biggest barriers is the automation behind the platform. Yeah. Because it's one thing to get a client, uh, to get a client on a recurring service. It's another thing to actually keep them <laughs> and to service them because you're right. I mean, there's, there's things that are going to, that are going to come up uh, that are, are going to need your attention and they're going to feel like because they're on a monthly recurring service and they're paying you regularly that you're going to be available to uh, take care of these things or that these things are just going to magically happen and, and take care of themselves. Right. And you need to be ready for that because some folks aren't and then they end up losing money uh, on the deal because, you know, they're constantly, you know, taking care of these manual processes and, and all of that stuff. Um, so, yeah, so, and I don't think we mentioned it. What is, what is Recur and um, what, how can it help folks better kind of manage the residential side of managed services? Right. So, um, hmm, where to begin? So, <laughs> we, we have all these problems, right, that I just mentioned. There's, there's a, a couple. So, there's like the automated billing is one of the main things. You shouldn't have to send people invoices and uh, manually build credit cards and then retry and all that stuff, especially when you're charging 10 bucks a month or 15 bucks a month or even 20 bucks a month to 200 people. Um, so that's one of the main issues we saw. Uh, the other main issue was something else I mentioned, which is automation within your RMM that's integrated. So turning off services that people haven't paid for. Mm -hmm. The third is really good marketing tools. So making it easy to market to many people in a scalable way. Um, the fourth is easy deployment. So when somebody comes in and, and Paco pitches them really well and they're like, yeah, hit me up. Give me the, I want 20. I'm going to pay you 20 bucks a month. Paco should be able to install it like that. Give them the computer back. Um, and it should automatically, when he does that, create a subscription in his CRM and automatically start billing the customer so he doesn't have to do anything. It's just automated. And you know, this, this, of course, this is going to save the computer business owner time and frustration, but it's also going to look really good to the client that all of this stuff is automated and taken care of because the clients see, you know, you as a service provider and they, they, they can tell if you're struggling, they can tell if you're flustered, they can tell if you're, you know, manually doing stuff that they're used to having done automatically because their cable company does it and their, you know, their water company does it and all the other places that they pay recurring services. They take care of this stuff automatically. They can update their credit card. They can turn on and off services with the click of a button. And if they see you fumbling around with this stuff, that's going to, you know, kind of look poorly on you. Um, and, and you don't look as professional as you can. So this, this leads back into marketing, right? It's not only right. is it helping you as a computer business, but it's putting that, that professional face forward to your clients. Totally. Um, and there's actually a couple other things that are kind of built into that. So I can do really good marketing, but if I'm not enabling people to pay me really easily, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> so for example, if I send an email to somebody and I say, hey, I have this thing, you can sign up for it, here's the link. 
they should be able to click that link and pay you and get the thing installed hmm. without yeah. you touching anything. Right. So that's another aspect. The, you know, the last thing, which is super obvious, is it shouldn't be expensive to do all this. Um, so all of that was kind of the impetus for Recur, which is an integration between Repair Shopper and Kabuto. So Troy was supposed to be on here with me, but he uh, he's on leave because he just had a baby. Ah, um, and congratulations to him. Yes, yes. So he he actually had a much better story for the whole pain thing. He had a web hosting <laughs> uh, he had a web hosting service at one point and he experienced all this stuff personally. So, um, anyway, all of those things I just said that were problems recur basically solves those problems. So now you actually know what it does (laughs) in repair shopper. You just set up the Kabuto recur integration and then you're able to see all the info in repair shopper, your self-service kiosk. They can go and pick a package And they can download it and then it'll automatically create a subscription and it'll automatically bill them. They can enter their credit card information there. It's all automated. If you are checking them in, you can go to any customer in Repair Shopper. It'll have a specific installer for them that'll automatically install it, link it to that customer, create the asset for the device. And the alerts will flow in from Kabuto and create tickets. Um, The... Hmm. You can have it with one click, create a subscription, which is or a recurring invoice for the device. So if they have managed antivirus and all this stuff, you set a policy in Kabuto, that policy matches up with a recurring invoice. And if they want to change their thing, they can do it in the self-service kiosk. It automatically changes their invoicing. If they fail to pay you, it automatically retries and then can turn off upgrades in Kabuto, so the whole thing is just an automated system. And now, when you're using that, you can just focus on getting more customers instead of doing your operations for your MSP. So I have a question as far, so with that self, so I guess this will lead into the other, I have two questions, but it'll lead to the first one better. Okay. Now, I know we covered how to market to new customers that come to us. And when we have this great, like you just said, Recur just came out, you know, there's going to be a lot of us that have both products. They mm-hmm. want to integrate them. They want to start rolling it out. And yes. it always seems to be easier, in my opinion, to sell existing customers that have good relationships. But how would we advertise that to customers that we may not have spoken to in a while or that we've serviced at one point just to let them know, hey, this is what we're offering and not sound so salesy? Totally. So we actually built, for those of you that use Repair Shopper, there's a thing called marketer, or I guess for those of you who don't, there's a module called marketer that essentially does email automation, drip campaigns and stuff like that. We built a custom marketer campaign, or I guess repair shopper built a custom marketing marketer campaign that will basically, you can customize it, but it basically sends an email to whoever you want and says, Hey, we have this service, click here to find out more. And it links them directly to the installer specific to them. So when they download that installer and run it, it knows that it's that customer Mm -hmm. and then links them to the customer in repair shopper. Now, do you find that the emails work better than giving them a call or uh, I guess that would probably be the only other option, right? If you were trying to get a hold of an existing customer, you know, I'm, I actually don't know. I don't have that data, but from a, theoretical perspective. They're not like mutually exclusive. I think that, um, again, and if you're doing this for residential clients, it probably doesn't make as much sense to just call them. Right. You're not, you're going to get as much out of that. So that's where a marketing, a, a marketer campaign where you can just hit everybody is pretty awesome. But then for gotcha. your small business clients and stuff, yeah, call. Them. Gotcha. Yeah, I was just trying to bring it home for those that, you know, who want to do the recurring services for whatever solution, because there's some that probably have built their own kind of custom thing to do for their recurring services. What's the best way? So, yeah, it makes sense for mass email. Now, the cool thing I've noticed that I do get a lot more responses from repair shoppers, marketer emails than I do from an email service such as MailChimp, Aweber, et cetera, because it, it legitimately looks like an actual email being sent 
from the email address versus it coming from, you know, help at prodigytext.com, you know, with the parentheses, blah, 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 at MailChimp.com and eventually goes into the promotions tab and may not even see them if they're using Gmail, right? So right. I've noticed that that also helps for those that are, if they're, you, you are using a CRM, I'm not sure if there's any other CRM systems that uh, orchestrate or um, make their emails to look like an actual email because you are sending it as a mass email uh, send. That's something to think about as well when you're uh, advertising in a mass way for your recurring services. Totally. Yeah, I think this this was kind of a no brainer connection <laughs> between you and uh, and Repair Shopper because uh, y- you guys have all, most of the same you know type of client and they're doing the same services and they're using both of your products and so why not just make it easy to integrate them, make everything automated, automate all the things and just you know make make it that much easier to to use both products and and we're both you know we're we're fans of both here on the show. Uh, we've had Troy on before and and. Uh, and he's again. He's a founder who started as a computer repair tech and and scratched his own itch. And he's you know been building up a repair shopper along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, so if if someone wants to check this out, um, I'm assuming you know they need to be both a customer of uh, repair tech and a repair shopper. And then is there some place they need to go or something they need to do to enable it? Totally. Um, yeah. So they basically log into their repair shopper dashboard and go to the app center. And there will be a separate card for Recur. So they can check that out. And the Recur integration has instructions on how to get started. You basically just integrate the two and it starts flowing. Um, One of the things that's cool about it is that in Kabuto, policies, which are like presets of settings that you can apply to any device, those match up with products that you can apply to people in repair shopper so you can have like your antivirus package and an antivirus package in repair shopper and that way um, everything is synchronized so it'll ask you to create those in repair shopper um, and then choose which ones match up with which policies and that's kind of how you get started cool perfect awesome and both um Kabuto and Repair Shopper integrate nicely with TechSite Builder. So you can throw all these links and buttons and stuff on your TechSite Builder website and just kind of get the whole thing flowing through. Um, and you can basically, you know, you can get it to the point where you're, the whole thing's almost hands off for you. I mean, you people, you know, through SEO and, and AdWords and Facebook ads, people find your website, they see the services you're offering, they sign up for it, they get it installed, it starts working, they're in uh, Repair Shopper. Um, and it all happens without you having to do a thing. And that's the beauty of this technology. Right. Uh, that's the idea. Yep. Awesome. Well, uh, some great insights and definitely cool to hear uh, about uh, the new stuff you got going on over there. And I think uh, definitely some useful feedback about um, how, to, how to market all this stuff once you get it going and once you get it integrated. So um, thanks for being a guest and, and thanks for the uh, awesome info. Uh, Ian, where can folks uh, find out more about what you got going on? Yeah, they can check us out at repairtechsolutions.com. Awesome. And I'll have a link to that as well as uh, kind of a walkthrough of the, the Recur process and, and integration uh, in the show notes for the episode. So check that out at computerbusinessmarketingshow.com. Uh, Ian, stick around for the rest of the show. We're going to have our computer business tip of the week here in a sec. And, uh, and I think you might have some thoughts on that. So <laughs> uh, stick around. Um, thanks again for being a guest. What we are going to do right now, though, is give a shout out to our second sponsor, and that is the Unconvention, the DC Unconvention 2017. This is the get together for computer business owners. Uh, This is the conference you want to go to this year. If there's one conference you're going to go to this year, I would definitely go to the unconvention. Um, It's unconventional, which is why we gave it that name. We wanted to give it, we didn't want to give it the the typical convention vibe where you go into, you know, a hotel uh, conference room. It's very, you know, very clinical, very business, very, you know, um, 
like the harsh lighting and the boring walls and everything. And, and it's just, and you sit there in a, in an uncomfortable chair and you listen to people talk all day. And then you go to a huge room with a bunch of vendor tables and they're all trying to pitch you and sell you and, and, and weasel their way into your mailbox and, and try to convince you that, that they're the next greatest thing. Uh, and, and that's kind of why we started the unconvention. That's why Corey Fruitman of instant house call started the unconvention last year because he wanted to create a different experience. He wanted kind of a meetup style gathering where computer business owners could get together, actually work with each other, talk with each other, um, and, and work with each other to, to talk about best practices, to talk about the technology that's working for them, to talk about um, you know, what's, how, how they've been building their business and then ask questions and get them answered. So that's what we're doing with the Unconvention. It's two days, September 16th and 17th in Washington, D.C., we got a cool co-working space set up for you, so um, it's it's very comfortable. It's it's a it's an area designed for you know getting work done and and taking care of stuff. It's got a an awesome uh, wall of windows that look out onto the the DC Mall and all the monuments. So you got an awesome view, and you spend those two days uh, basically doing workshops and and hanging out with other computer business owners. So on the schedule, we have stuff like um, you know. Uh, working groups where you get together in small groups and talk through what's working and not working in your business around certain topics like pricing, marketing, uh, productivity, that kind of thing. And then we all get together at the end of the working group session and we present what our working group came up with. So the group as a whole can benefit from what each working group came up with. We're going to have labs where you can get hands on with different technology and different techniques. We'll talk about things like um, the best way to set up uh, network diagnostics and simulate a network for troubleshooting network issues. We'll talk about SEO. So that's going to be my lab where I uh, talk about the tools and the, the things that I use to track SEO for websites. Um, Mike Smith from the Mike Tech Show is going to talk about the using the right tool for the right job. So he's going to dig into his tech toolbox and all of the not only physical but also software tools that he uses to get the job done. And then we're also going to have uh, sponsors there who are going to have labs and conversations as well. So unlike, you know, the other conferences where you go to a room and you have all these booths of marketing booths set up, at the unconvention, the sponsors are there attending the event with you. They're sitting there. They're in the working groups. They're in the labs. And you can have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with these folks outside of the, the boothy kind of environment. So you can, you know, sit down during lunch. And, uh, you know, over sandwiches, ask them, you know, hey, what, what, what's going on with this feature? Hey, you know, it'd be cool if, if you did this or whatever. And it's kind of a cool way to have a dialogue with uh, the sponsors that are going to be there. Uh, lunch and breakfast is provided both days. And uh, we got a lot of other cool stuff scheduled. So check all of that out at unconvention.io. When you're ready to sign up, use the promo code TSB, and that'll give you $40 off your admission ticket. So it's already uh, pretty affordable, but that'll just get it that much more affordable for you as a loyal listener of the Computer Business Marketing Show. So again, check that out at unconvention.io. Use promo code TSB to get $40 off, and we'll see you in DC for the unconvention. All right, guys. Uh, so for the tip of the week, the marketing tip of the week this week, um, I'm going to just kind of do a rant, <laughs> a little bit of a rant for you. So um, I've, I've just noticed, and this is something that comes up again and again, ever since Facebook started making an ad platform and making it available. Um, I found, especially for computer businesses, a hesitation to use Facebook ads. And when, when, uh, computer business owners end up using Facebook ads, I hear two, two, two stories. Either it absolutely doesn't work, it's a scam, or it's just you know marketing BS from Facebook. They just want to take my money. It doesn't work. And then there's another group that says, it's working great. I'm getting lots of, you know, lots of interactions, lots of, um, lots of sales from it, and, and it's working great. So you, know, you see these two users of Facebook ads and People say it's a scam. People say it, it works really great, but they're, they're all, you know, running computer shops and they're all doing break, fix and managed services just like everybody else. What's the big difference? Um, and what I find from the folks who, who run Facebook ads, but don't see good success from it is that they're not, they're not giving it enough attention and they're not thinking it through and they're not giving it enough time. So what, what you got to realize about Facebook ads is for them to be successful, 
uh, first of all, you need to, to test different ads. So you need to try different images, try different calls to action. Um, and, and remember that, especially for break fix, uh, when you're advertising things like the virus removal or you know, blue screen of death repair or um, cracked iPhone screen repair, these are things that um, are only needed when they occur. So someone who's, who's looking at Facebook and their phone's perfectly fine and they see a cracked screen repair ad, that's not going to do anything for them, right? But if their phone screen is cracked and they see an ad for cracked screen repair, hey, perfect timing. Let me let me check it out and click on it. So so that's goes into where you need to kind of be patient, right? There's there's people who aren't going to need your services if you're running an ad for a week. They might not need your services during that week. But if you consistently run your ads, test them, um, you know, improve them, and then. Uh, and, and, you know, especially for that kind of thing, for repairs, um, then eventually you're going to catch the person who, who's, whose laptop is broken and they need some help and they're going to click on your ad. Um, also, something uh, else to keep in mind is think about uh, what you want out of the ad. So, you know, a lot of folks, they just boost a post and they don't get any engagement from it and they don't get any sales from it and they say Facebook ads don't work. Um, when really, first of all, boosting posts isn't ideal. You want to run a, a proper ad through the business, Facebook business account. Um, and then you need to, you know, have, have a game plan. I mean, for me, I run ads, um, to get people on my mailing list. First and foremost, I don't expect to get direct sales from Facebook ads normally because uh, a lot of times people are busy or a lot of times, you know, people see an ad, they're not sure what it's, a, what you're about. They don't know your business yet. So they want to do some more investigation. They want to learn about you. So, you know, have that ad lead to some sort of uh, lead magnet, like an ebook or a free consultation or sign up for my newsletter, something free, something easy for them to take that next step with you. Then they're in your ecosystem. Then you can start to nurture them. And then you can build that relationship that you know, has been a tale as old as time with marketing, right? Building relationships. You're, it's going to be hard to get a sale from someone right away. But over time, once they're on their ma your mailing list and they learn about you, then they'll eventually, you know, purchase from you. And that could be two, six, 12 months down the line. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind that Facebook ads aren't necessarily going to always lead directly to a sale. What they are going to do is get your business in front of people. What they are going to do is, um, make people aware of you, know what services you offer so that when they're ready to purchase, um, they can do it. Um, I, Ian, I know you, you, you have some experience running Facebook ads. Is, is, yeah. that, is that kind of in the ballpark or is, is am I way yeah. off on that? Or? No, you're, you're right. Uh, I would say that the people that usually don't do well with Facebook ads are, there's a couple of things. First of all, you have to know what your metrics are for success. So like, what are you trying to get out of this? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, can you measure that? So as an example, um, let's say I want to get people to go to my website if they have a broken computer. Pretty typical, right? Okay, so if they go to my website, how do I know if they came from the Facebook app? And then how many jobs do I need to get for this to be worth it for me? So it, essentially, you have to get yourself a pass-fail type of metric that you're measuring, and then you have to make sure that you're measuring it. So a uh, example of that is let's say my average computer repair job is $75. And um, what I want to do is I want to do a cost per click ad on Facebook. I would probably never boost a post. Um, I'd probably only do like cost per click or maybe cost per acquisition ads. And then I would target people in my general area um, that match certain criteria, for example, like their certain age group. Um, they might be a certain income level. Maybe you want to have them be interested in certain things. I don't, maybe they've, maybe they've searched for computer repair recently or something. There, there's a bunch of interests you can put in Facebook. You can play with that. But in general, the smaller the group, the better. Um, which right. is something that people don't usually realize, but if you can target it to the ideal customer, that's the best. So you're going to miss out on some people when you do that because you're ruling out people that might come in for a computer repair. But at the end of the day, your cost per customer is going to be better. So um, 
figuring out what your cost per customer is and then make trying to get it less than like 30% of your average sale price. So if your sale price is, let's just say it's $100 because that's easier for my math brain. Um, then if you can get a customer for $30 or less, that's pretty good. Um, so I would say that that's one thing is like trying to adhere to tracking metrics and making it trackable. And then the hard part is how do you track that? So there's a couple things you can do. One is you can have a unique phone number that they call. So maybe you make a, a landing page just for Facebook ads and you put a different, like a Google voice or a Vonage phone number in there that's different. Um, that way you can track how many jobs you got from that phone number. You can have a different email address. Um, but however you choose to track it, as long as it's trackable, it's okay. Because otherwise you're in the dark and you don't know if it worked. Yep. And, and one thing I've been doing is, is like with the Facebook pixel, you can install the code on your website and then set up a, um, I forget what they call it on Facebook, like action or something where uh, you can track if someone clicks on your ad and then ends up on your thank you page after filling out your form. So mm -hmm. that way you can see how many people filled out your contact form through the Facebook ad. Right. Uh, that's a way to track that as well. But I'd, I'd also stress having realistic goals is important as well because a lot of folks write off Facebook after running it for three days and not getting a, a sale. Um, and, well, first of all, you know, again, if you're not tracking it properly, you might've gotten a sale from it. And you don't know. But thirdly, you know, running an ad for three days and not getting a sale is, you know, is pretty typical. But what you could maybe have gotten in those three days was brand awareness. You could have got some folks to sign up for your mailing list. Um, and, and three days is probably not enough time anyways to, uh, to right. really focus, to, to have enough time to, to test your message. Cause a big part of it is the message, right? To make sure you're hitting home with your target client with that message. And Facebook makes it pretty easy to test stuff out. You just have to take the time to let Facebook run through its testing algorithm to figure out what's going to work best for you. Yeah. There's a general strategy for thinking about if you've ran, run your, campaign long enough and spent enough. So let's say you use the 30% rule. I kind of made that up at some point. I don't really know where I heard that. You, know, you can take it with a grain of salt. Anyway, let's say your, your goal is to get a customer for less than $30. So if you spend, if you have a Facebook campaign, the first time you do it, first of all, it's not going to be finely tuned. You're going to get better at it over time. So realize that your first experiment is probably going to be your worst acquisition cost because you're only going to get better at it. Yep. So if you spent like $200 and you have gotten a certain amount of clicks and you think it's statistically significant and your cost for acquisition is more than twice as much what you're trying to do, then maybe it's not working. So if you're, if you're at $60 per, ac per acquisition and you've had, you know, 20 acquisitions or something, then yeah, it's probably not going to work. But if you're at $45, you can probably fine tune that to get it down to 30. So uh, that's just like one yep. way of thinking about, um, have you done enough experimenting? Right. Yeah. So, uh, just things to keep in mind. Um, a lot of people, you know, uh, run Facebook ads to get likes on their page. And, and I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of that because, um, even when someone likes your page, they're not necessarily going to always see what you post on there. And, that, and then other than just social proof of, hey, I've got a lot of people liking my page, there's not much more that that's going to do for you. Um, and you're spending money on it. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, really, you know, go for the getting people onto your website, off of Facebook and onto your website is, I think, the best way to use Facebook ads. Cool. Well, we could, we could go into a whole nother episode on this, so I'll, I'll end it there, but uh, that's just something to keep in mind, you know, and, and not just with Facebook ads, but any type of advertising, any type of marketing, especially if it's new and it's something you've never tried before. Um, you know, listen to folks who, who it works for and how it's working for them. Uh, and, and then spend some time with it, spend some time learning with it, spend some time, uh, spend some time, experimenting with it and testing it. Uh, it works for other people for a reason. Uh, and uh, it might eventually not work for you, but at least give it, you know, the old college try um, and, and do work smarter, not harder as far as, as that's concerned. Cool. So um, 
That's it, guys, for this episode of the Computer Business Marketing Show. Let's keep the conversation going, though. So head over to the Tech Site Builder Facebook page or computerbusinessmarketing.com. And in the show notes for this episode, let us know what you think about stuff we talked about. Are we, you know, are we going crazy with Facebook ads and they really don't work? Or uh, have you had success with them? Um, when you're trying to, how have you been marketing your recurring services? Have you tried Recur? What do you think about it? Um, all that stuff. We love to hear feedback from you guys. So head on over to the website. Also, you can send us questions via email to mail at techsitebuilder.com or just visit computerbusinessmarketing.com. We have a contact form over there that you can fill out as well. And if you listen to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, be sure to give us a shout out and leave a review. We'd love to hear your feedback and every comment helps so that the podcast can be found by others out there. Yep. And don't forget to check out our sponsors, Tech Site Builder and Unconvention.io. Thanks for listening to the Computer Business Marketing Show. My name is Matthew Rodella. And this is Paco LeBron. Saying here's to your success. Mm-hmm.